Hello and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program's homeowner webinar series. My name is Jen Marvin. I'm the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Statewide Coordinator. Today we have Dr. Brian Botter speaking about lethal bron bronzing disease. Uh, your microphones have been muted. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Please stick around until the end of the presentation to take the survey. It helps me give you the kind of programming you like and lets us know how we're doing. Our next presentation will be on October 18th, 2022, and will be given in collaboration with Wendy Wilbur's Master, Garden, Master Gardener Volunteer Webinar. Uh, so let me introduce um, Dr. Rotter. Brian is an associate professor of entomology at the University of Florida, specializing in insect vector ecology of plant pathogens. His PhD and postdoctoral research was focused on identifying vectors of viruses and grapes in Washington and California, and is currently focus, focusing on lethal bronzing disease in Florida palms. His emphasis is on combining basic and applied research in both entomology and plant pathology to develop IPM strategies to fight lethal bronzing. Um, with that, if you would like to take it away, Dr. Rotter. Thank you, Jen. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in uh, for my, my presentation this morning. As Jen mentioned, I'm a, an entomologist by trade. Uh, as, a, as a kid, I was out in the woods collecting bugs. And then when I was 10, I learned that you could actually get, get paid to do that. So it seemed like a no brainer to me. And then uh, I guess I never grew up. So uh, here I am. And uh, today I'll be sharing um, some background and some basic and applied information on lethal bronzing disease here in Florida, which uh, many of you probably are to some extent aware of the disease, um, but if for anybody who's not familiar with it, um, I see somebody from California who will be in Florida soon, you're gonna see it all over the place once you get here. So. Um, for those who aren't aware, I'm going to do a little bit of background on what it is and then jump into um, how to identify it and then some more applied aspects to, to management. So with that, I'll get started. Um, and uh, before I get too much into the, the nitty gritty, uh, I'd like to thank my, my uh, funding sources who've been instrumental in supporting my research program over the years uh, to allow us to go from very little knowledge about this disease to a point where we're in a position to start developing IPM programs. So uh, these are my funding agencies listed here, uh, primarily within the US, but we have a few international partners who have been supportive as well. Uh, so quick thank you to them. And with that, uh, I'll jump into the background on uh, these diseases. So lethal bronzing disease is a phytoplasma infection. And phytoplasmas are a type of bacteria. And uh, these bacteria over uh, evolutionary time have kind of become more obligate parasites, meaning they need a living host to survive, whether that's a plant or the insect that transmits them. And lethal bronzing, just for anybody who's heard this other name, uh, which I was talking with Melissa prior to the, the beginning, uh, Texas Phoenix Palm Decline was the original name of lethal bronzing. And uh, we've kind of been rebranding it uh, over the years uh, to fit this naming scheme of uh, a older disease in Florida called lethal yellowing which is another type of phytoplasma infection that got introduced in the early 1900s and kind of wreaked havoc on coconut palms in South Florida. And LY has kind of died down in recent years. Uh, it's still out there uh, and moving around, uh, but it doesn't seem to be as abundant uh, or widespread as, as lethal bronzing. So, 
Uh, this map you're looking at here is the current known distribution of where we have confirmed cases of either lethal bronzing or lethal yellowing. You can see we have uh, South Florida. Uh, Texas isn't included in this map, uh, but it's, it's over there as well. It's in the Bahamas, a lot of the islands in the Caribbean. Uh, Jamaica is actually where the disease was first categorized. So that's kind of the epicenter of, of palm phytoplasmas. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with them in uh, the Yucatan in Mexico. And they extend south into Nicaragua uh, in Central America and then in the islands. Just the other day, I reviewed a, a disease note uh, that documented it from Guadalupe. And that's kind of the uh, distribution of both lethal yellowing and lethal bronzing. Now, something important to note, and we'll get into details on the vector later, but uh, I'm doing survey work throughout the Caribbean for this disease, but also the insect vector. And we have specimens of the vector uh, from as far south as central Colombia in South America. I have a lot of specimens from Costa Rica. And I just went earlier this year to Trinidad and I collected specimens there. So the range of the vector goes down into South America. So the potential range of these diseases, if they continue to move, uh, is uh, down into to South America. But these are the confirmed um, localities of uh, either lethal yellowing or lethal bronzing. Uh, and then you can see I put a, an image of a coconut palm up there in the upper left. And that one is from here at our research center in Davie. And uh, it is dying to lethal bronzing. So coconut is actually susceptible to both um, LY and LD. Uh, and that's um, across the region, that's pretty characteristic of, of what the dying plant looks like, but I'll go into more details on symptoms in a bit. So I mentioned a little bit about LY, it got introduced in the early 1900s. Lethal bronzing is a more recent phenomenon. Um, the disease itself was first uh, identified in Texas in the late 1970s from Canary Island date palms, which is why it was called Texas Phoenix Palm Decline. And in 2006, it was first found in Florida on the West Coast near the Tampa area. And you can see on the map here, this is the current distribution and confirmed cases. Since its introduction into Florida, it has spread uh, throughout much of the state. And at this point, I would be willing to bet if you really looked, you could probably find it in just about every county. Um, the data here is from samples submitted by stakeholders. So it's pretty good, but um, in these other counties, it could just be a lack of um, people aren't looking for it um, or it's kind of out of the way, but I, there's so much of it throughout the state. I suspect that if you really looked, you could find it in just about every county. But these are the confirmed records of lethal bronzing that we've received from, from stakeholders. Um, now, I uh, quite a few years, I guess it was 2017, when Irma came through, uh, my family and I drove north because uh, we weren't sure what it was going to do. And I mentioned to Melissa and Jen earlier that um, for me, the fear of hurricanes is not being without power or falling branches. But if we're stuck indoors with two young children for any length of time, it's, it's, it's not fun. So we thought we'd just drive north. Um, and go visit grandma and grandpa. And on the drive, I noticed some palms along the road in Georgia and one at a gas station in South Carolina that looked highly suspicious. Um, so I think that LB could be up in those other states as well. Uh, and a few years ago, I did a vector survey and I found the vector uh, as far north as Southern South Carolina. So again, the potential of this disease in terms of its distribution is really going to be limited by the vector range. Now, you can uh, 
it's possible that a palm can be shipped somewhere that's infected and it will die there. But if the vector is not there, it's not going to spread the infection further. Um, I don't know if, how many people are familiar with the stories uh, that I personally witnessed and can vouch that they're true, but um, I'm originally from Delaware and some of the the bars and, and nightclubs up there, they import palms from Florida every year to give that kind of tropical vibe to the, the location and they're outdoors on the beach. And they, they bring with them nests of uh, fire ants. So people are dancing and hitting the tree and then everybody's getting stung. And it, it, it adds a nice extra um, twist to the night. Um, but uh, it happens that when you move palms from areas where you have these pests and pathogens, you can take them uh, with them. Now it's so cold up there, the fire ants didn't survive. And the same thing, if you shipped up a palm with phytoplasma, it could be recorded from another state, but that doesn't mean it's a problem there because there aren't palms naturally or the vectors not there. But um, it's important to note that this disease is on the move throughout the Southeast. And I think wherever there's naturally palms occurring, uh, specifically cabbage palm and the vector exists, uh, it will be, there will be potential for spread into that area. So now I want to talk about symptoms. Um, and I know we're focused on lethal bronzing, but it's important to note that whether it's lethal yellowing or any phytoplasma in palm, the symptoms are going to be fundamentally the same. Um, and when we renamed Texas Phoenix palm to, kind, to lethal bronzing and they named lethal yellowing, uh, it was focused on the color. And as we've learned about this disease, we've learned that the color is not as important as an indicator of the disease as is uh, the combination and progression of symptoms that you're going to see. Uh, for example, the lethal yellowing, it only causes yellowing in uh, certain cultivars of coconut palm. Uh, the and actually when lethal yellowing was first described, if you read the, the publication, the author describes a bronzing of the fronds. Um, so it, lethal yellowing, it causes bronzing in a lot of uh, the susceptible hosts, uh, as does lethal bronzing. It causes the uh, brownish bronze coloration in older fronds. Uh, and that color can vary from species to species. Uh, and basically we found that the symptoms in the canopy are due to physiological stress, not the pathogen um, doing anything to that tissue. Um, we did a, an experiment where we tried to test for the presence of the, the phytoplasma in the canopy. And in all of the leaves that display symptoms, the pathogen is absent. So what's happening is this phytoplasma is getting into the vascular network of the palm and basically uh, choking it to death. Uh, so it's exhibiting this severe stress uh, that manifests uh, in the first place, it's going to be a necrosis of the flowers and premature fruit drop. So you can see this image on the right is a necrotic inflorescence from a coconut palm. And this symptom is uh, always going to happen in a phytoplasma infection, uh, but you don't, won't necessarily see it in a fungal infection in the palm. A palm can be almost dying of fungus, but it can still have uh, a healthy inflorescence or fruit attached to it. Uh, but if it's a phytoplasma, the very first symptom you're going to see is necrosis of any emerging flowers or the premature drop of fruit. And this is a result of the, the palm being stressed on uh, because of nutrients. Uh, now, for species like coconut palm that is essentially always putting out flowers and always has fruit on it, uh, it's going to be a reliable symptom to use. Now, 
in other species like cabbage palm and phoenix palms that have a more temporal uh, production of these structures, it could be that it could be infected at a time of year when it's not naturally producing. So uh, it's not going to always be the best character uh, or symptom to use to diagnose it. Um, so you kind of want to watch to see what happens next or carefully monitor it if you think um, you have an infection. So on the left here, you'll see a healthy cabbage palm. And then on the, the next, uh, let's assume that that healthy palm gets infected. So you're going to potentially see the inflorescence die and the fruit drop. The next thing you're going to see in this um, symptom progression is the oldest fronds. So the fronds that are closest to the ground, they start to dry up and die. And that's where you get your characteristic uh, bronze color uh, in a phytoplasma infection. Then you'll see in the moderate symptom picture, uh, this drying and dying of uh, fronds starts to move up further into the canopy, affecting younger and younger leaves uh, as it uh, progresses. And then you can see on the, the, the last image of the palm, uh, it's the late stage and basically around 50% canopy loss, the spear leaf will collapse due to the apical meristem dying. Uh, and it's that point that the palm is dead. Uh, so, so that's pretty, uh, that's a characteristic series of symptom progression. Uh, as far as we know, the phytoplasma infection in a palm is always fatal. Uh, we've never documented a case of a plant that gets infected and then uh, naturally recovers that that doesn't does not happen. Uh, so it's a pretty severe uh, problem in that if a plant gets infected, it's, it's going to die, uh, which is uh, rather unfortunate. And it makes uh, it makes part of managing the disease difficult because um, we recommend aggressive testing for determining if plants are infected and any plant that's infected uh, needs to be removed immediately. Now, the problem with this is you typically people only notice the disease and start testing once the plant develops around moderate symptoms, uh, but usually around the late symptoms is when people really start to get scared, they quickly get stuff in and test it. Um, and the irony is that that palm on the right looks the worst. And that's the one people want to get out of the environment fastest. But in all reality, that palm is uh, zero risk for further spread of the disease. Because if you notice, all of the canopy and green leaf tissue is dried up or um, dying. And the vector will not feed on that or acquire it from that tissue. The vector likes uh, living healthy uh, green leaves uh, to feed on. So uh, the irony is that that healthy palm on the left, if it's infected, that's the one that's most dangerous for spread of the pathogen. And that's the one that uh, you're going to want to remove immediately. And basically, uh, that's a very difficult um, strategy to propose to somebody if they have a perfectly healthy palm uh, to get it out of their yard. Uh, because as I mentioned, it's going to die eventually. And the sooner the palm is removed, the sooner you remove that source of pathogen uh, that could spread to adjacent palms. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, antibiotic treatments in palms and how that plays into this. Um, but this was just to show you the, the symptom progression. Uh, it's quite variable in terms of how long it takes to develop the symptoms. Uh, it's anywhere from four months to a year of a latent period between when the insect inoculates the plant with the pathogen and when that plant starts to show symptoms. Then once the symptoms start, it's a matter of weeks to like a month or two uh, from symptoms appearing to the plant dying. 
but there's a high degree of variability. Um, I've seen plants hang on for like eight months. Um, others, it's like a week and they just completely fizzle out uh, very rapidly. Uh, this could be due to the amount of phytoplasma that's injected into the plant, where the phytoplasma is injected into the plant, uh, the overall health of the plant, um, or a combination of all of these variables and, and maybe other ones. So uh, the, the variability we see in the time progression of this uh, is reflected by the environmental conditions that uh, where the disease is spreading. So, um, but on average, I would say seven months latent period uh, to one month uh, to two month decline um, is on average what, what I've noticed. Um, so with that, I'll go to the next slide. So here I have a table in summary of the palms that are susceptible to these pathogens. Now, I have the palm species name, the scientific name on the left, uh, the common name uh, just next to it. Now you'll see there's a column for what's labeled as subgroups. Uh, and this is um, even in the, the published literature, it's, a, it's an absolute mess and highly confusing. So I've been pushing hard to change this naming system. And, um, but all of the old literature report they don't use traditional species names for the phytoplasma. They uh, designate groups using a Roman numeral and subgroups for species. So uh, all you need to know is that subgroup A is what was traditionally lethal yellowing uh, and subgroup B and D are the same thing and they are what we currently call lethal bronzing. So you can, uh, I put that there on the right, so you can then go to the columns and see uh, some palm species are susceptible just to LY, some are susceptible just to lethal bronzing, um, some are susceptible to both. Uh, and as LB spreads throughout the state, this overlap in susceptible host is uh, growing. Um, now, you'll notice there's an E in there, uh, and I haven't talked about that. That's an obscure species of phytoplasma that's only known from the Dominican Republic uh, that, as far as we know, is not here. Uh, but we just recently developed a new diagnostic assay that allows us to test and differentiate all three of these phytoplasmas. So if you send me a sample to test to evaluate your palm, uh, we now have a test that picks up all of the strains of the, the, the phytoplasma. And I'll talk about the sampling and the testing here in a moment. But this is a summary of the uh, currently published hosts of lethal yellowing and lethal bronzing. Um, 19 species for LB, 27 for LY. Uh, but recently, we just put, uh, got a new paper accepted documenting two new hosts of lethal bronzing, uh, Aranga and Glari, which is called the dwarf sugar palm. That's the images on the top there. And then, uh, excuse me, no, uh, Aranga and Glari is on the bottom. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, I'm not a botanist. Uh, then the needle palm is Rapidophyllum hystrix, and that's the image on the top. And we got samples from a stakeholder and they came up positive. Then because they were new hosts, we sequenced multiple genes just to be extra sure. And sure enough, they came up positive. Um, now, the interesting thing was that we got a sample of cabbage palm that also tested positive. But in our assay in the lab, it came up as positive for lethal yellowing. And I thought there's no way this is, this is true because LY has been in Florida since 19, the 1930s. And 
never was shown to infect cabbage palm. So we did the same thing. We tested it multiple times, uh, and then we tried for different genes and sequenced everything, and everything came up as lethal yellowing. So my, I, it was very confusing to me, but I, you know, sat down and started thinking it through. And the best explanation I can have for this is that um, historically, coconut palm was the dominant plant planted in, in Miami and South Florida. And I wasn't here uh, during, you know, at that time. So I, I didn't experience the full force of, of lethal yellowing in South Florida. But what I can tell from talking to my predecessors and looking at old photos of the area, uh, everything was coconut palms in South Florida. And that's where LY was. Then uh, it wasn't until, and this is just from my observations and, and how I'm looking at it, recently they started planting a lot of cabbage palms in uh, Central and South Florida with all of the new uh, highway beautification projects and uh, plantings that FDOT has done. They started planting a lot of cabbage palm and Phoenix palm everywhere in the state, even in, in Miami, uh, my, <clears throat> excuse me, Miami-Dade County. So now cabbage palm is becoming more exposed to LY. Um, you know, cabbage palm was down here in the, in the, the seventies and eighties when LY was really bad, but it wasn't as abundant as coconut palm. And it could be that coconut palm was a preferred host to the insect vector, and they generally avoided the cabbage palm. But uh, that's what I think was going on, is that there wasn't a lot, as much cabbage palm. And now that there's more of it, just by probability, it's allowed for LY to finally infect it. Um, that's my best hypothesis at the moment. Um, and, you know, my mind could, could change easily on that. But that's that's my, my thinking on why cabbage palm has finally showed up as a host of lethal yellowing. Now, as uh, homeowners who have, ha uh, you know, specimen palms in their yard, um, we do offer a sampling and testing service. Uh, this service is, is available to everybody. Um, you know, FDOT has submitted samples, nurseries, landscapers, uh, and homeowners, extension agents, um, even colleagues. And, you know, I test my own plants from, from time to time just out of curiosity. And um, it gives the kids something to do on the weekends. So, uh, but basically what we do is uh, we offer a service that allows, if you have a plant that's dying or, uh, are concerned about a plant, we can test and confirm whether or not it's phytoplasma and help guide uh, management options in terms of antibiotic injections, uh, give recommendations on plant removal, and also assessing uh, vector populations and the potential risk of nearby palms or the risk of replanting uh, should your plant die. Uh, so a quick rundown. Uh, the process for sampling is pretty simple. Um, we flame sterilize a drill bit uh, in a, on a power drill. And uh, basically we have a little portable propane tank and uh, flare that we uh, sterilize it, uh, cool it down with some distilled water. And then basically we drill past the pseudobark, the dead outer uh, layer of tissue. And we kind of just drill past that, uh, scrape it aside, and then go back into the same hole and drill into the living trunk tissue. And that's where the phytoplasma resides. So that's the tissue that we need. Um, if you send a bag with the brown dead outer tissue, uh, it's always going to come up negative uh, because there's no phytoplasma in that tissue. It's the um, vascular inner living tissue where the phytoplasma uh, survives. So generally we ask for about three grams of sawdust from this hole. Uh, 
um, three grams of sawdust is about enough to fill one of the old film canisters. And um, and if anybody uh, uh, was born bef um, after the advent of the internet and is younger and doesn't know about film canisters, uh, I'm sure you can Google it to get a reference on, on the size. Uh, but, you know, a small Ziploc baggie um, is an is a adequate uh, container. Just drill out the, the, the sawdust, put it in the Ziploc bag uh, and label it. Uh, we like for a bare minimum of um, having the date it was sampled uh, the city and the county and the palm species. Uh, and that we keep on our internal records for monitoring the, the, the spread of the disease. Uh, but on you'll see on the sample submission form on my website, there's lots of other little areas of information that we, we like to have um, just for our, our reference. Uh, when you sample a palm to test, it needs to be shipped overnight uh, to this address I have here. Um, and generally, if you're going to ship it, um, don't ship on a Friday because uh, it'll sit somewhere until uh, Monday. And it's probably not the end of the world, but if there's a lot of moisture, mold can grow rather quickly. Um, so, uh, if you're going to ship overnight, uh, ship it Monday through Thursday. Uh, now, if you can't ship it right away, like if it's a just for whatever reason uh, and you need to sample it, but you can't ship it the same day, if it's a couple days, you can put the sample in the refrigerator. Um, so if you notice it on a weekend or something like that, um, and you're busy with work early in the, the next week, uh, you could sample it on a Friday or Saturday or Sunday and just put it in the refrigerator and then uh, ship it out on, on Monday. That'll be, it'll be fine uh, to do that. Uh, alternatively, if you, for whatever reason, need to sample it and it's gonna be more than a few days, you can put it in the freezer and then just take it out the day uh, that you're ready to ship it and it, it, it'll be fine. Um, but you can find all of the uh, EDIS documents and forms with instructions on, uh, detailed instructions on how to sample, uh, where to send it, um, and uh, all of the pertinent information you need. It's on my website there under the services tab, uh, so you can download anything. Uh, I also have all my research publications there, um, so if you've got kids and want to put them to sleep, uh, that's good material to read to them. Okay, so that kind of uh, concludes most of the uh, information that you need for basically looking at uh, palms in the environment and getting a sense for if they're infected, how to sample, um, which palm species to be looking at. Um, and uh, so now I think I have some time. I want to talk a little bit on the vector because uh, this is a, a critical component to managing this disease, uh, not only in the nurseries, but in urban settings, uh, including uh, our own backyards. So a little background. Uh, when I first started, we, we did some survey work in areas with disease spread. And we determined that this insect here, uh, Haplaxius crudus, uh, it was the only insect in the area that was carrying the phytoplasma naturally in the field. Uh, and subsequent tests, we found that the insect was, was capable of acquiring the phytoplasma. And it determined that it takes an, the optimal number of days to acquire it is, excuse me, uh, five days of feeding on the, the source material. So uh, we did these experiments basically to, to determine what insect was responsible uh, for spread of, of the disease. So uh, that's a critical component necessary to developing uh, IPM strategies that has been missing in, in prior years. It, uh, 
prior to this, everything has been focused on just removing trees and OTC injections, which uh, can be helpful, but it's not enough, obviously, to eradicate the infection or bring it under control once it flares up. Uh, so now with this knowledge, now we can start developing uh, more well-rounded IPM strategies. Oops, sorry. Uh, so basically, from prior knowledge and with the recent advances on determining the vector, uh, we have three major areas of uh, management for palm infecting phytoplasmids. Uh, you know, this could be used for LY. We'll just, you know, discuss it in the context of lethal bronzing. But uh, these are more or less going to be effective for either disease uh, because, as it turns out, the vector of lethal bronzing is the same insect that transmits uh, lethal yellowing. So there are, uh, there's an antibiotic called oxytetracycline, uh, OTC. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a common antibiotic. It's, it's used in, in people and animals. It's a broad spectrum. Uh, and it's formulated and registered also for use in palms uh, for managing phytoplasma infection. Now, uh, basically, if a palm's infected, do, you should not be injecting the antibiotic. It's only effective as a preventative treatment, uh, which is is contrary to how humans treat bacterial infections, but uh, I'm gonna show you in a moment why uh, we don't recommend in injecting infected palms and only recommend injecting healthy palms. Uh, so OTC uh, is a, as a preventative, is a helpful strategy. Uh, rapid tree removal, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, a big component of this is testing your plants for phytoplasma. So if you have a dying palm on your property and it tests positive, that's great. But you need to test nearby palms that looked healthy uh, to make sure there's no other infections in the area. And if there are, to start removing any palm that tests positive for phytoplasma. And this can help you kind of get ahead of the infection. Uh, and finally, uh, vector management. So uh, the end goal here is to kill um, kill the insect or remove the habitat uh, that it likes or or thrives in. Okay, so now I'm going to touch on the OTC, the antibiotic, and um, show you uh, why we don't recommend um, injecting healthy palms, or excuse me, um, infected palms. So we did a study where. Uh, I actually did what I'm telling you not to do. Uh, basically, we identified palms on our research center that had the infection at different stages of decline. And we injected some with antibiotic, and then some were our controls where we did not introduce the antibiotic. The top row, A through D, are, is a palm that was early in its symptoms, and it basically, uh, was injected with OTC and we significantly slowed down the phytoplasma infection. So at one year uh, into the study, there's still a living spear leaf and living tissue. Uh, we didn't stop or reverse the infection, but we significantly throwed it, uh, slowed it down, excuse me. You can see in the bottom is our control. And at one year, there's nothing left of that, that plant. So this was great because it showed us that the antibiotic does uh, attack the phytoplasma and it's effective on it, uh, but it's not enough to cure the palm. And basically why I recommend not uh, injecting a plant, uh, even if it slows down the symptom, is it's basically going to make your problems worse because there's still phytoplasma in that canopy. So if you're prolonging the amount of time that that source of bacteria is present in the environment, you're increasing the likelihood of a vector acquiring it and spreading it to a new plant. So 
that's why we recommend if a plant tests positive, uh, cut your losses and get it out of there uh, as soon as possible so it doesn't spread uh, to the uh, to neighboring plants. Now, I always say that there's one exception to this. If you have a single plant on your palm on your property uh, and it's dying uh, and you hate your neighbors, by all means, inject away and then it will spread to them. But otherwise, uh, you, you want to get it out of there as, as quickly as possible. Uh, okay, so now um, where I see the most potential for slowing this disease is vector management. Uh, and we started learning about this in the palm nurseries just because that's where it was uh, the simplest to work and operate. Uh, and then the idea was to take what we learned in the nurseries and start applying it when we could into urban settings and to see what um, what variables were consistent across the two environments. So basically what we did was we went into the nurseries and we were curious about the distribution of, of Hyplaxias crudis in the nurseries. Now, the adults of the vector, Hyplaxias crudis, they feed in the palm canopy, but the immature stages actually feed at the base of grasses in sedges. Um, so they're not up in the palm canopy, they're down in the grass. And what we did was we went into these palm nurseries, into these plots, and we took samples of the grass uh, from the beds. Uh, you can see in this left image here where the palms are, that's a raised bed. And in between them are these ditches where you can see a close up, that's where all the water accumulates and the uh, grass really starts to take off. So we sampled these plots uh, monthly for, uh, we're coming up on two years now. And we found that over 95% of the vectors nymphs, the immature stage, they feed in the ditches between the beds. So we identified the preferred habitat of the vector which is critical towards managing it. So basically we found that if you remove all the grass from the ditch, you almost eliminate the vector population, uh, but at the very least you've brought it below, uh, the population below the threshold needed for disease to uh, really take hold in, uh, in an area. So that's a cultural practice that could be used. Uh, but as I'm going to talk about in a little bit, there are insecticides that you can treat in grasses that are effective at, at killing the, the vector. Um, we also found that the breeding habitat, they seem to prefer the shorter palms. And I think this is due to, uh, you can see here on the left, the green fronds of the palm are much closer to the, the grass and the immature habitat. So I think they prefer breeding in these types of habitats because uh, the adults are breeding in the palm canopy. And when the leaves are closer to the ground, it's just uh, less distance. So it's less risk to the females um, to uh, migrate from the fronds into the grass. There's less chance of, uh, you know, bad weather getting them, uh, predators, uh, whatever uh, is out there, uh, it's a safer journey um, on the shorter palms than, than on the taller ones. Now, uh, some of this are factors that we're now using to guide our efforts in the urban setting. And we're just starting to do research to see what kind of uh, nymph distribution and uh, habitat preferences these bugs have in in our own backyards, along the roadways, our parks, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but some encouraging data is we found that a common insecticide, uh, imidacloprid, that's used commonly in turf grass to control things like chinch bugs and ground pearls and other hemipterans that uh, are a problem for the grass, it's also highly effective at killing Hyplaxias crudus. Uh, we did some studies with palm seedlings and adults 
Uh, they're, they're just easier to work with. And we found that using a, uh, a broadleaf spray or a soil drench of imidacloprid uh, resulted in very quick uh, knockdown of uh, Haplaxius crudus. Um, now we did the experiments on palm seedlings and adults, but uh, the, the insecticide, it, it will work on the immatures. And since these compounds are already formulated and uh, the label approves them for use in turf grass, um, you can already be using these compounds to control other pests. And they're also going to be effective at knocking back Haplaxius crudus um, population. Now, uh, the final thing, I think almost done. So this is my last slide. Uh, basically, the next stage of the research is identifying where in the urban setting these nymphs are hiding. Uh, I have a, a few grant proposals out and we're started collecting data. Uh, but you can see this image here where you have the well-maintained grass, but then, uh, I just didn't feel like edging or cleaning up around the base. And when you have, uh, what I've noticed is that they like moisture. So if there's nearby moisture and you start to get these uh, overgrowths of grass, this is the ideal have, um, setting for, for nymphs. Uh, now, because there's so much variability in the urban uh, sprawl of um, South Florida, Central Florida, uh, and even up around, around Jacksonville, uh, it may not be the same scenario every time. So this is why uh, finding this data is going to be a little more challenging, uh, but basically going to be necessary if we're going to manage populations of this vector in urban settings. Because at this point, excuse me, it's a major problem in the nurseries. Uh, but now it's kind of taken a life of its own, taken on a life of its own out in the urban setting. So we need to uh, focus on vector management, not just in the nurseries at this point, but in in the urban setting. And that's where we're heading um, heading in the in the near future. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your your time and attention. And uh, here is my contact information, my email phone number, uh, the lab site again, and the, the address. Um, uh, you know, you're, anybody's welcome to, to stop by uh, if they wanna see the, the protocols for how we test for the palms. Um, I will force you to look at my bug collection, uh, but that's, that's the nature of it. So uh, I guess with that, we can open it up to, to questions and answers. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, the first one is the last question that you got. Can you please type the name of the chemical control? I think uh, this person was talking about the chemical control on the last slide that you had. Okay. Um, let me, I can go back on the slide so you can see that. Uh, so imidacloprid is the, the compound. Uh, the, you can see here in the legend in the graph, uh, 75 WSP um, is the soil drench and 2F was the spray. Uh, we tested a granular and it didn't work that well. Uh, and just for disclosure, I'm not uh, plugging these products. That's just what we used. Uh, and what we had on hand and was uh, effective. Uh, but imidacloprid in general, uh, regardless of, you know, who's selling it, uh, is going to be effective. Um, my wife jokes that imidacloprid is my solution for all of life's problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, are there still issues in Texas and are they doing anything there for it? Um, yes, there's still disease in Texas, um, I don't think, I know they have restrictions uh, on moving palms from Florida uh, because the disease is much worse here than it is mm -hmm. in Texas. 
So I know they've kind of blacklisted a few species of plants uh, and aren't allowing them in from Florida. Uh, but their local practices, it, it's not as bad there. So I don't think they're as, as worried about it. Um, and then up along the other Gulf states that have it, uh, like Louisiana, um, uh, same deal. I know there's restrictions on moving plants from, from Florida. Uh, but it's, it's there, but uh, Florida uh, has it the worst. Uh, okay. Um, how worried should we be about LY and sable palms? Uh, not that much. Uh, I included it and I reported it just for me, it's, it's more of a scientific fascination from a homeowner's perspective and an economic perspective. It doesn't matter. Um, LB is far more prevalent and it's killing, killing the cabbage palms. Uh, LY, um, it's spread by the same insect species. Uh, so once we have solid management protocols in place for the vector, um, it, it shouldn't matter uh, too much. So uh, like I said, with symptoms, they're the same between the diseases really. And the difference between LY and LB, uh, so now you're starting to get into more, uh, you know, deeper questions of what the true biological differences are. There might be some difference in susceptibility of some palm species versus others. Where I see the big potential difference between the two, oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. which insect species can transmit it. So Paplexius crudus can transmit both of them, but there are other species of insect that are close relatives out there that may be able to only transmit LY or lethal bronze. But under Florida conditions, uh, in my mind, it really doesn't matter at this point if it's LY or LB. I keep track of it from a scientific standpoint, but um, for from your end, I don't, I don't think it's um, terribly critical or need to be concerned about know why because it's spread by the same bug and as we're seeing the the overlap and host between the two is uh starting to increase okay uh can you do testing after a palm is already dead uh good question yes so uh okay. we've done some experiments and found that you can detect the phytoplasma dna reliably up to eight months after the the palm death uh, and at a year, you still can, but it's a little more inconsistent and difficult to obtain it. But uh, even at a year, um, if you really yeah, need to know, uh, it, it is possible. Yeah, I did that. But, you know, when you're okay. Um, yeah. How is the hole left after drilling? I'm guessing they're talking about uh, drilling for a sample. Yeah. So uh, this is one of those uh, things that I never, you know, they, they always did it and told me to do it. So I did it when I started, but then when I sat down and thought about it, I was like, well, this is a little strange. Basically, if you're sampling a palm that's dead or dying from LY or LB, uh, the hole that you've drilled into the plant, uh, they've always recommended plugging it with a golf tee or a dowel rod. But if the plant's dead or dying, it doesn't really matter <laughs> if there's a, a hole in it. Uh, now, if you're testing palms that look healthy, you think are healthy, and you want to check their status, those I would recommend a, uh, a dowel rod that is about the same diameter as the, whatever drill bit you're using. Uh, I typically use a 5 16th inch drill bit, and I recommend the cylindrical dowel rod because I've noticed with the golf tees, because it has that tapered shape, um, the sap and the juices start to fill in and it allows it to kind of push it out of the hole over time. Uh, the dowel rod, if it's nice and snug up against the inner, um, the, the hole where you've drilled, uh, the inner pressure isn't going to push that, that dowel rod out. Um, so, but generally uh, that's to prevent uh, potential uh, fungal invasions or other insect pests from getting in and 
and damaging if it's a healthy pump. So. Got to unmute there. Uh, this one says, sorry, I missed it. Do you do the nymphs require stagnant water or the actual vegetation to proliferate? Can they be found in surrounding uh, ornamentals besides grasses and sedges? Um, so they're feeding on the grass. The moisture requirement, I think, is more for humidity and um, that angle. They're not necessarily developing in the standing water, but they, if there's a lot of um, humidity generated from that, that's, that microclimate, uh, they seem to like that. Um, now, their host range on other ornamentals, uh, as far as we know, nothing has yielded that they're consistently found on other things besides grasses and sedges. That being said, there are over 40 species of grass and sedge that these insects are documented from. So within the grasses and the monocots, uh, they have a wide host range. So um, it could be um, Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass, um, and I'm sorry, I'm not a, I don't know a lot of the, the weeds, at the, monocot weeds, but a, a lot of those are suitable hosts for, for the vector. So uh, if it's not St. Augustine grass, if there's a, uh, another grass or sedge nearby, they'll, they'll, they'll feed on that. But they're generally restricted to, to those types of plants as, as nymphs. Is LB affecting uh, queen palms? Uh, yes. So queen palms are a documented host of uh, lethal bronzing. Uh, again, it's not as readily infected as um, cabbage palm or phoenix palm, but it is, we consistently get samples that are, are positive. For it. Okay, uh, let's see. How about dwarf date palms? My new one died quickly. Um, so that species is also susceptible, but doesn't appear to be as susceptible as um, other phoenix. So the ones that are really hit hard by this are phoenix canariensis, dactylifera, and sylvestris. Uh, phoenix robolini is, it's susceptible. We, we have had a handful of cases in it, uh, but it's not as uh, susceptible as some of some of the other ones. Um, in general, I um, that is a that's a species that I think is a is a a good one to plant. It's not um, it's not highly susceptible. It doesn't seem, uh, and it's a kind of a fast grower and. Uh, on the cheaper side. So in the event that it does get infected, it's 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 more practical to replace those than, than a canariensis. Okay. Uh, if we use imidacloprid, should we cut off and flowering? Um, uh, okay. Yeah, I've heard, I've had this question before about the impact of the, uh, insecticide on, on pollinators. Um, so basically across the board, I whether imidacloprid's in, in the equation or not, uh, you should probably be cutting off inflorescences uh, and fruit on palms uh, because I've noticed that when you allow the fruit to develop, that's a huge nutrient sink. So if you if you don't cut that off, then uh, you're going to have new. You're more likely to have nutrient problems. So cutting off the inflorescence or the fruit can help the the overall nutrient uh, sink as a region of the plant. Now, I don't.
from what I've read in the fruit and pollen, I don't think they've definitively shown that the imidacloprid will translocate to that tissue. Um, I know in the event of OTC, when they inject palms, they, ver they do not find the OTC in the, in the coconut and in these reproductive tissues. So I personally don't think it's a risk to pollinators, uh, even if you leave the flowers, um, I think the, the risk is minimal. Um, but if you want to be cautious, you can remove them and it has the dual benefit of uh, helping out with reducing the nutrient uh, uh, requirements of, of the plant. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't particularly think it's a risk to pollinators, um, but that it's, uh, you, there's no harm in cutting off the flowers and inflorescences on palms um, if you want to be safe and, and benefit the plant in, in other ways. Okay. Uh, what is the injection OTC? The injection OTC is the antibiotic. Uh, it's OTC is just an abbreviation for oxytetracycline. Uh, and uh, I have an EDIS document on my website that you can download and, and, and read all about that. Okay. Uh, is there any research being done to develop an insecticide that will kill the vector but not beneficial pollinators? You kind of answered that a little bit, but. Um... Uh, yeah, and, you know, I'm not, I don't. I haven't followed too much um, the the impacts of imidacloprid on on beneficials and look. I haven't looked closely at that that data. Uh -huh. I know there's a compound. I have some new experimental chemicals from um, Syngenta that are much less toxic to beneficial insects across the board. And they've given those compounds to me to screen them against crudis to see if they're effective. So uh, we are looking at other compounds that are, are less harmful um, than, than some of the traditional insecticides. So it's, it's something that we are actively, we, we actively looking at. Okay. Uh, what is the cost of the testing and do you take samples from out of state? Um, so, the standard test is uh, $75 per sample. And basically that test involves, it technically involves three different tests. Uh, we do uh, quality control and make sure the, the data is consistent because uh, the last thing we want is to tell somebody it's positive and it's healthy and they remove a, um, they invest in removing a, a healthy plant. Um, so uh, we have the, the $75, the standard test. Uh, we have a uh, highly sensitive test. Um, it's called digital PCR, and that one is $200 a sample. And we don't recommend doing that test for individual palms uh, because it's so expensive. That is really designed for nurseries, where they have you know, bulk shipments of plants and it's a way for us to pool samples. Uh, so if they have to ship out 20 plants, we can pool the samples and test it and test it once. So essentially it's a way to validate that all 20 plants are healthy for $200 rather than spending $75 a sample. Now, the, the downside of that is it doesn't tell us how many palms and which palms are infected. Uh, but if a palm is in that batch infected, it comes up as positive. And then we have to uh, work with the grower to, you know, do you wanna just, is it more cost effective to destroy the batch or do you wanna go through and test each plant? Um, but it is, that test is highly sensitive and it is possible to do on, on a single plant uh, if, if somebody really, really wants to. But um, the, the standard cost is $75. Okay. 
uh, if replacing an infected, infected palm, how long to wait to plant the replacement? Um, so that's a somewhat challenging question because it's not like a fungal infection. So, uh, you know, if you replant in an area where there's been a fungal infection, that plant is probably going to get it and die fairly quickly. With lethal bronzing, uh, in theory, you could replant same species right in that same spot and immediately after removing the other one, and it can be fine. Now, if the vector, if that's a plant that was brought in already infected uh, and there's no vector in the area, then that then it's perfectly safe to replant immediately. Uh, and that's why when we tend to get these infections and people remove plants, uh, I try to work with them to assess the vector population and risk in the area. So if you have a plant that's positive and you remove it, then we go in and try and assess what the population looks like. And if we send out sticky traps and they're coming back with like, you know, 20 to 30 crudis on the traps, we can test the bugs for the phytoplasma. And if they're coming up positive, then um, you probably are going to want to implement some kind of uh, vector management, either cultural practices of eradicating the suitable nymph habitat, uh, insecticide treatments, whatever. Uh, but bring that vector population down uh, so that you can then, then replant. But if we send out sticky traps and you know we don't see any Haplaxis crudis on the traps, um, you know, with a certain degree of confidence, we can say, okay, you're, you're probably going to be fine. Um, so it's, it's a case by case, uh, situation. Okay. Last question. Uh, our Canary Island is pruned by our HOA hired landscaper. They do not clean their tools between trees. Is the tree doomed? Um, not for phytoplasma. Uh, phytoplasmas are only transmitted by uh, insect vectors. Um, they have to feed on the living tissue. Uh, the mechanical transmission uh, has never been documented in phytoplasmas and is not generally uh, a concern. Uh, now, canariensis is susceptible to fungal pathogens and fungus can, can easily transmit by mechanical means. So, um, they should be cleaning their tools, but it's not a risk for lethal bronzing, but certainly it is a risk for um, something like fusarium. Okay, well, that was, uh, I think that was our last question. Yep, this is our last question. Um, Dr. Bodder, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your knowledge about lethal bronzing. My pleasure. Um, everybody, I hope you have a great rest of the day. And uh, we'll see you um, in October. Thank you. Um, one thing I saw yes. a request on the slides. So if anybody wants a copy of the slides, uh, just send me an email and I'll send you a, it's easy for me to just convert to a PDF so the file size isn't too big. And then I can just uh, reply and I'll, I'll send you the slides. That way you have, have the information. That would be great. This uh, recording is also going to be available on our website uh, in about two weeks. So um, look under webinars and um, past webinars and you'll find it. So um, great. Thank you, Dr. Broder. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.